Hi everyone, um, good evening and welcome to our Carcanet book launch. Uh, my name's Jasmine, I'm from Carcanet Press. Um, thank you all for being here. Um, tonight is very exciting. We're here to launch uh, the collected poems of Moya Cannon. Um, this beautiful book has just come out this month. Um, so thank you for being here. Uh, we are joined by Moya, who is going to give us a lovely reading later. And we're also joined by uh, Margaret Kelleher, who will introduce Moya and introduce the book in a second. Um, and later on, Moya and Margaret will have a bit of a chat together. Um, now, uh, Margaret is a professor of Anglo-Irish literature and drama at University College Dublin, um, among some other interesting ro roles. So uh, thanks to Margaret for being here to launch this book with us. Uh, I will hand over to her in just a second. I just want to run over a couple of things before I do. Now, um, you may have realised already you can't turn your cameras on um, and we can't see you and also we can't hear you. So I can see that some of you have found the chat. Please all do find the chat box say hello to us, let us know what you think of the reading this evening. Um, later on, we're going to have a Q&A with the audience. Um, so there is a button somewhere on your screen for Q&A. If, if you do have questions for Moya, please pop those questions into the Q&A box and Margaret can read them out to Moya later on. Um, so what's going to happen tonight is this event will probably last about an hour or so. Um, as I said, I'll hand over to Margaret in a second before Moya's reading. Now, during the reading, I'm going to show the texts uh, so that you can read along on screen. This is for accessibility purposes. So um, if, if you're having trouble with your screen or you prefer to see Moya a little bigger than the, the text or vice versa, you're in control of your own computer. So please do have a play around with it to get it to the way that you need it to be for yourself. Um, after the reading, like I said, Margaret and Moya will have a bit of a discussion before we move on to our audience questions. So please do get those lined up. Um, we'd love to get you involved in the conversation this evening. Um, now, you've all paid £2 to be here, so thank you. We really appreciate that. Um, we appreciate your support. Um, you are entitled to getting a, a copy of the book with £2 off it. So um, please do check your emails tomorrow. You'll get a link there. Uh, and if it doesn't arrive, just get in touch with me and I can point you in the direction of the website with the discount code and things like that. So um, I think that's enough from me. I'm going to invite Margaret to join me on screen now um, and we'll begin. Hello everyone and again I'll add my words of welcome Farron Falcha, Fear Queen, Rose Galair. I can see already from the chat that I have a richly representative function this evening uh, as the conduit of congratulations and indeed of celebrations. But I'm especially glad to have the chance to express my deep personal esteem and admiration to Moya for her poetic work, for its vision, its scale, its wisdom, its craft and its generosity. So it's a deep honour for me to launch with her this evening this landmark volume, her collected poems, which gathers poems from her six principal published collections to date, or the parchment boat, carrying the songs, hands, Keats lives, and Donegal Tarantella, but also, as we'll hear this evening, from new poems. To introduce Moya formally and briefly this evening, Moya Cannon was born and grew up in Dunfahy in County Donegal. She studied history and politics at University College Dublin and later took a graduate degree in international relations at Corpus Christi College in Cambridge. Following a teaching career in Galway, during which she published her first two collections, her election to Ace Donna in 2004 allowed her to pursue writing as a full-time occupation. She has been editor of Poetry Ireland Review, and was the co-director of a summer course in creative writing in NUI Galway for many years and her international residencies and visiting professorships include a residency at Trent University, Ontario, and the Heimbold Professor of Irish Studies at Villanova University. Moya's awards include the Brendan Behan Award for the best first collection of poetry given for her collection OR, and the O'Shaughnessy Award from the University of St. Thomas in Minnesota. As we'll hear this evening, and as you, her readers, know, Moya Cannon's poetry brings us as readers on memorable and impactful journeys, guided by the past wisdom of history and geology, 
by the continuing inspiration of music and the visual arts and towards the most vital contemplations of human and planetary futures. So, Kogardika so Kri Maya Asoktan Eant Untaksha, and it's my pleasure to invite you to read this evening. Gormaigat um, Gamor, Margaret, um, it's an absolute delight to be here this evening, and thank you all so much for coming. I can't see you, but I can certainly feel your presence, all of you. And um, I'd like to start first with by thanking so many people. Um, all Michael Smith and all his wonderful staff at, uh, at Clarknet Press, and great editors and Jasmine and Becky and Alan. And um, I'd also like to mention Gallery Press and Salmon Press who published my first books. And uh, a very special thanks to the Arts Council of Ireland, which uh, has given me and many others the, the opportunity of writing full time. Um, I'd also like to thank many institutions have been supportive over the years and my, my very, very supportive family and friends. And lastly, Margaret, I'd like to thank you for that very, very generous, uh, very, very generous introduction. I'm not quite sure how I'm going to live up to it, but I'll do my best. <laughs> um, I, I'm going to start um, with a, a poem called Tem. Uh, and Tem is an Irish word. It's just one of those wonderfully onomatic uh, words which appear in, a, in every language, which lie very close to their meaning. Um, it means uh, a great wave, a great wave of emotion, usually, a um, wave of love, tem, tem gra, tem, uh, maybe perhaps a wave of anger, tem berige, tem brown, uh, a wave of sorrow. And I wrote it, this is an early poem, I wrote it at a time when I was young and assailed by these great waves. It, and it, it's really about the mystery of language and the mystery that we can actually communicate our inner lives to each other. Tem, the unexpected tide, the great wave uncontained, breasts the rock, overwhelms the heart in spring or winter. Surfacing from a fading language, the word comes when needed. A dark sound surges and ebbs, its accuracy steadying the heart. Certain kernels of sound reverberate like seasoned timber, unmuted truths of a people's winters, steerings of a thousand different springs. There are small, unassailable words that diminish Caesars, territories of the voice that intimate across death and generation how a secret was imparted, that first articulation, when a vowel was caught between a strong and a tender consonant, when someone in anguish made a new and mortal sound that lived until now, a testimony to waves succumbed to and survived. I'm going to follow that with a poem called Vogelherd Horse. And the Vogelherd Horse is the little chap on the cover of the book and I have him here behind me. I, uh, I came across him first in an exhibition of the Age of the Mammoths in Paris in 2004. And he it was the, in the last case, tiny, tiny little fellow. He's just about uh, two inches long. And um, he, at this stage in 2004, they thought he was the oldest, uh, oldest known sculptor in the world. And um, with, they've since found older, older sculptures. But uh, I was absolutely blown away by the fact that something so very beautiful had been made so very long ago. Our idea of uh, Stone Age people from that period is uh, somebody very rough really and this refinement sort of was evidence of something quite different and uh, this was I think sort of 50,000 BC to 30,000 BC I think it's a period when language developed and um, but the time when we became human really we genuinely human probably and um, art is central to that I think making something beautiful I felt is quite central to our humanity. So Vogel heard horse 30,000 BC. There is an epigraph here from John Berger. He said, art, it would seem, is born like a foal that can walk straight away. I meant to say that this is the same period as the painting, it belongs to the same period as the Chauvet Caves. When John, when John Berger saw the paintings, he said, uh, Berger, he said, um, you know, we don't, we don't draw any better now than we did then. It reminded me of what Iris Murdoch said, the arts do not progress in the same way as the sciences. No one's better than Homer. 
The horse is half the length of my little finger. Cut from mammoth ivory, its legs have been snapped off, three at the haunch, the fourth above the knee, but its neck arched as a lipizzaner's, its flared nostrils are taut with life. The artist or shaman who carved it as totem, ornament or toy could hardly have envisioned that horses would grow tall, would be bridled, saddled, that of all the herds of mammoths, lords of the blonde steppes, not one animal would survive, that the steppes would dwindle, that in the stacked mountains to the south, rivers would alter course, but that this horse would gallop on across 10,000 years of ice, would see the deaths, the mutations of species, excuse me, would observe the burgeoning of one species, Homo Faber, the maker, who had made him or who, using a stone or bone knife, had sprung him from the mammoth's tusk had buffed him with sand, taking time with the full cheeks, the fine chin, and had set him down on the uneven floor of the Vogelherd cave to ride time out. Um, when I was about, uh, when I was 10 in 1966, we had in Ireland, we had the, of course, the um, commemoration of the 1916 rising and I uh, was keen to die for Ireland. It's very good to get it out of your system young. And my grandfather had headed off to the, um, to the, the, um, the rising in Dublin, um, but he had met with the countermanding order issued by Owen McNeil, um, which sent people home really, most of the people from the countryside in Ireland because he, he realized they weren't armed and would be slaughtered. And I was a bit disappointed that my grandfather hadn't been in the GPO and hadn't been a hero. But even at 10, I realized, I, I sort of wondered about my grandmother. And um, I, many years later, I uh, was talking to a friend and discovered he was a great grandson of Owen McNeil. And I said, I bet my grandmother was very, very grateful to your great grandfather. So this is the countermanding order, 1916. And my young grandmother, what of her? Was she too dejected? No documentary evidence exists. My mother, too young at seven months to remember herself, used to tell us. She heard the horse and trap in the yard again and couldn't believe her ears. What was my grandmother doing? Did she clear away a half-eaten Easter dinner, talking distractedly to her two little boys as she scraped jelly from a glass bowl? Did she mix feed for hens or pigs or wonder about bringing cattle in for milking? Did she pray or take out her handwork? Was she putting the baby down for her rest? Only hours earlier in a swept farmyard, she had said goodbye to her husband of six years, her exiled lover of seven more, whose letters had been carried in steamships across Caribbean and Atlantic tides. On this Sunday morning, had they embraced as he headed for the muster at Dungannon, as he enjoined her to bring up the children as good Catholics and good Irish men and Irish women. My mother in old age was to remark with a raised eyebrow, wasn't it a bit cool of him all the same? Now, as the trap clattered in through the gate and the horse rebel halted in his familiar place, did my young grandmother wipe her hands on her apron? Did she rush to the door? Although the rising had been called off, although the great cause seemed lost again, did her heart not rejoice? Um, uh, <clears throat> I spent a very pleasant time in Canada in 1996, and uh, I was very moved when I was there to come across in the writing of the wonderful short story writer, Alistair MacLeod, to come across a little song, which I had learned as a child in Donegal, which had traveled over to Scotland with migrant workers, and then had traveled to Nova Scotia. And uh, I uh, was thinking, isn't it extraordinary how very often it's the poorest people who bring the songs with them? And I wondered if it might be because they more than anybody else needed to create the emotional, 
climate, the emotional weather of their own country in their new host country. And then uh, I heard another story a few years later, um, the wonderful singer Myra Nibono told me about her brother Michal going up to Donegal to collect songs from a blind aunt. And he thought he might get a dozen songs. She was a great singer and he came back with over a hundred. And many of these songs had come from um, from uh, the aunt's mother, Myra and Michal and Trina's uh, grandmother, because when the young men used to go to Scotland to work for the summer, they used to ask their girlfriends, what present will I bring you? And their grandmother always said, bring me back a song. And there's something wonderfully poetic about the fact that uh, her grandchildren brought those beautiful songs all over the world. So this is called Carrying the Songs for Trina and Myra Nivona. And there's an epigraph from the Dublin, marvellous Dublin singer, Frank Hart. He said, those in power write the history. Those who suffer write the songs. It was always those with little else to carry who carried the songs to Babylon, to the Mississippi. Some of these last possessed less than nothing, did not own their own bodies. Yet three centuries later, deep rhythms from Africa stowed in their hearts, their bones, carry the world's songs. And for those who left my county, girls from Downings and the Rosses who followed herring boats north to Shetland, gutting the sea silver as they went, or boys from Ranafast and Hornhead who took the dairy boat, who slept over a rope in a bothy. Songs were their soul's currency, the pure metal of their hearts to be exchanged for other gold, other songs, which rang out true and bright when flung down upon the deal boards of their days. Another poem about music, a different music in a different place. We were in France a number of years ago and we, were, we went to a wonderful series of concerts in the Bouge Mountains. The Bouge Mountains are these, they're the little brothers or the little sisters of the Alps, these magnificent limestone mountains. We were going up these, these harpen bands, these virage and across a plain and then up more harpen bands and we were late and cranky and we arrived into this tiny crowded church and a quintet from the, um, from the um, Berlin Philharmonie played this astonishing music and we came out in a totally, totally different mo mood, uh, totally elevated. And uh, it's just one of those moments when you think, what, how does music do it? What is the mystery of music that it, um, it can completely draw irritation out of us? So this is Night Road in the Mountain for the Berlin String Quintet. The great black hulks of the Bouge rise so high that this midnight the plough's starry coulter is sunk in them. Earlier in the small crowded church in the upper valley, five musicians played for us, stood, bowed, and then played on and on, munificent as a mountain cascade in spring. We do not know, we do not understand how five bows drawn across five sets of strings by gifted joyful hands, can trace the back roads of our hearts, which are rutted with doubts and yearnings, which are unpredictable as this ever swerving mountain road down which we now drive, hugging the camber, informed by rhythm and cadence, happy to live between folded rock and stars. Uh, I, I've, uh, I love mountains. I, um, I'm not a very good hill walker, but I'm never happier than when I'm on the side of the uh, mountain. And uh, a few years ago, we went with some friends to Connemara and it was a great weekend. And one of the walks was up in the Mam Turks was in Bing Brickon. And it was beautiful February light, but, you know, that November and February light where everything is thrown into relief. And uh, it was bitterly, bitterly cold. and uh, but everything was, when we looked on, it was all grey and silver. And thinking of all the myriad lives down there. So this is winter view from being Rickon. In the mountain top stillness, the bog is heather crusted iron. A high hidden mountain pond is frozen into zinc riffles. We have tramped across a plateau of frost smashed 
frost smashed quartzite to the summit cairn. Far below in February light, lakes, bogs, sea inlets, the myriad lives being lived in them, the lives of humans and of trout, of stone chats and sea sedges, fan out a palette of hammered silver, grey and silver. Um, uh, this is a, a poem about a, an aeroplane poem. It used to be that uh, writers spent a fair bit of time in aeroplanes and uh, the world is probably better for the fact that we're not traveling so much in aeroplanes and probably won't, possibly won't in the future. Um, I was crossing the English Channel and again, beautiful sunny day and then there were little tiny clouds and their shadows, so the shadows on the water and the ships going over and back. And I thought how remarkable it was that this was once the southern part of Doggerland and that people in not that very long ago were walking across and I wondered in their very short lives if they had seen the changes that we have seen in our lives as the tide rises higher and higher. I, uh, when I went to Galway first, I was very excited when the, when the water sort of used to go over the keys, and sh shimmered over the keys. And now I um, now when you go down, you see these great, bar great plastic barriers, flood barriers to keep the water out. So I wondered about those people, had they noticed that they were less responsible, they weren't responsible for the rising waters. I think we do have some responsibility. So this is um, from above the English Channel for Rachel Brown, a photographer who has done a series of photographs of clouds from, uh, from planes. Every cloud, even the smallest tuft, drags its own shadow behind it on the skin of a silver blue sea. Foam followed ships are white tadpoles. They have forsaken and seek out the primal embrace of harbours. Families of nomads walked across here before a great inundation which parted land masses. Who witnessed its beginning? As weather grew warmer and growth came earlier, as tides rose a little higher and land at the tide's edge vanished for the first time. Um, and another aeroplane uh, poem. I was very fortunate to have been invited to uh, Buenos Aires to read in uh, 2016. I was absolutely thrilled. My grandfather had, had worked in Guatemala and so it was always a great romance about, uh, about South America, Latin America generally. Anyway, I was coming back. I'd had a rather sobering diagnosis the day before I left and we're, I was passing over Fortaleza in northern Brazil and looked down and thinking of all the people down there, all with their concerns and their bills and their babies and their worries and their joys and their loves. And uh, no, then inside every single person, all the cells of their bodies behaving or misbehaving. And uh, one of the, those moments you were sort of just the dizziness of all of that complexity. And uh, I also had you know, the moment, you know, the way we're, we're used to flying and you know that statistically you're much, much safer in a plane than you are in your own car. But sometimes it seems very strange to be held up in a metal box high in the sky. So this is called Hands. And it's for Eamon and Kathleen. It was somewhere over the northeastern coast of Brazil, uh, over Fortaleza, a city of which I know nothing except that it's full of people, the life of each one a mystery greater than the Amazon. It was there as the toy plane on the flight monitor nudged over the equator and veered east towards Marrakesh. But I started to think again of hands, of how strange it is that our lives, the life of the red haired French girl to my left, the life of the Argentinian boy to my right, my life and the lives of all the dozing passengers who are being carried fast in the dark over the darkened Atlantic. All of these lives are now being held in the hands of the pilot, in the consciousness of the pilot. And I think of other hands which can hold our lives. The hands of the surgeon, whom I will meet again when I return home. The hands of the black haired nurse who unwound the birth cord from my neck. The soft hands of my mother. The hands of those others who have loved me. Until it seems as though this is what a human life is. 
to be passed from hand to hand, to be borne up improbably over an ocean. Um, and actually, it was on my way to uh, Buenos Aires. I had a reading in Florida and I was at dinner and met a young historian. And um, anyway, I, I asked her an incredibly stupid question. So this is uh, one of the most foolish questions. One of the most foolish questions I ever asked was of a young historian in Florida. I asked her that Irish question used to keep conversation flowing. If she knew where her family had come from originally, she paused and said, it's difficult. You can tell a certain amount from auction sales records and cargo lists. But one family, she said, had a song which they had managed to track back to a village in Senegal. Um, this has been one of the strangest, strangest years that most of us, certainly of my generation, will ever have lived through, <clears throat> and terribly uh, tragic in, in so many ways. But um, uh, I'm going to read a frivolous poem first. It's, uh, it's called Classic Hair Designs, because uh, I think it's appropriate, because uh, hairdressers have never been appreciated so much, I think. Uh, I lived, uh, when I lived in Galway, where I lived for about 30 years, I lived next door to a... Uh, a hairdresser called Classic Hair Designs and many of the, uh, the, the clients were elderly and my very elderly neighbour, Mrs Howley, had moved away to live with her son and, uh, but I saw her one day coming back to get her hair done. Every day they're dropped off at Classic Hair Designs, sometimes in taxis, sometimes by daughters, often by middle-aged sons in sober coats, who pull in tight by the curb stride around to the door and offer an arm. How important this almost last vestige of our animal pelt is. How we cherish it. The Egyptians braided bob, those banded Grecian curls, the elaborate patterns of Africa, the powdered teetering pompadour, the 60s long shining fall over a guitar. And the fine halo of my almost blind 92-year-old neighbour, permed and set in the style in which she stepped out with her young man after the last world war. On a more serious note, um, there are very few of us who don't know of somebody who has succumbed to this terrible disease. And um, for them, I'd like to read in memory of those people and for their relatives, I'd like to read a poem called uh, Delete Contact Card. It's happening more often now. Going through my contacts list, I find the name of an old friend, a decade or more older than me, with whom I spent sunlit afternoons, laughing and talking about life and poetry, and I don't delete the card. As though a computer list could hold a soul for a month, a year or more in some limbo or bardo. Rain falls on the red bushes, the talkative postman still delivers books and letters, and with a small thump, a goldfinch lands on the window feeder. Life does go on without the dead, and no matter how much we wish it, we won't ever know for certain whether or not the dead watch over us until our own cards await deletion. What we do know now, better than we used to, is the worth of that honeycomb of ours spent laughing and talking, the sun-washed, unwasted hours of human contact. And I'm going to finish now, and I want to thank you all very much for not for coming out this evening, but for staying in. Uh, and you could have been uh, going to the pub, going to the opera, uh, uh, having a quiz with your families. Uh, anyway, thank you all so very much. And thanks so much to Margaret and to Jasmine. Uh, hugely appreciated. Um, I'm going to finish with a poem called At Three, uh, At Three Castles Head. 
uh, we catch our breath. And there's a quote here from uh, Antonio Machado. We come from a, a hidden ocean and go to an unknown ocean. Um, a couple of summers ago, we spent a lovely week in West Cork and went to a place called Three Castles Head. And uh, just were just walking along at a promontory and suddenly came over a little hump and saw this sheer, sheer shining cliff. And I gather it's where the, the layers, uh, sedimentary uh, layers had been tilted on edge, had been metamorphosed and, and uh, tipped up on edge. And behind us was this marvellous bank, was main bank of primroses and, uh, and violets. And uh, it's just one of those dizzying moments where you just think how oh, these, these little flowers are responding to a star out there. That's why they're blooming now. And the complexity of geology and cosmology and botany and then ourselves and our consciousness and our involvement in this. And indeed now our responsibility for this just all kind of came together. Three castles head, we catch our breath. A flat vaulted slab of cliff soars and shimmers far above us, then slants far below into a young ocean we call the Atlantic. Bedded sandstones have been tilted on edge here, dust of disappeared mountains compressed beneath the weight of disappeared oceans. What cosmic accident engendered this relentless complexity of being, the hot metal core, the mantle heavily swirling under new hills, thin floored oceans, fragile cities. And under the flowering bank of earth behind us, which responds again to the nearing of a star. Each unfolding primrose, an inch of yellow velvet, each heavy violet teetering on its slim stem. And us latecomers balanced between cliff and flowers, trying to comprehend both, trying to catch our breath. Bring my for a couple more. Thank you so much, Moya. Uh, the chat is ringing with applause, applause, <laughs> and thank you indeed for our, our soul's currency. Um, as Jasmine said, we have time for a conversation uh, between the two of us to begin with, and then I look forward to feeding in uh, some of the wonderful questions that are coming already um, in the q and A. I suppose I wanted to start, Moya, with the occasion of a collected poems. It's obviously a chance to revisit, um, I suppose, one's early life in particular and, to, and one, one's early writing life. And just want to read a, a wonderful comment by you on the Karknish blog this week. You say, when I started to write poetry in my early 20s, I discovered that we do not choose our subjects. They choose us and constantly surprise us nor do we choose our imagery, which surfaces from all we have experienced and imagined from early childhood. And my question really is to ask you to tell us a bit more about the importance of poetry in your early life and then your early writing life. Um, well, it was always there. I mean, I, I never, I, I had no aspiration to be a writer uh, at all. But it was always there. My my, it was it was kind of important. I think in in the curriculum we had at school as children, you know. And uh, but my parents were both in different ways quite interested in poetry. My mother um, had a really deep love of it, and she studied English. She was uh, again both my parents really were the first in their families to have got a secondary and to some degree a third level education. She'd studied English at Queens, and uh, she had a deep love of it. And she had met, when she was quite young, she met um, and befriended the old poet Alice Milligan, who was a very important presence in, in her, her life. Um, so poetry was kind of important. And my father, as a young man, had written quite a bit of poetry in Irish under a female known to Plume. Actually, Roshan Ikegwil, it was sort of a play on a local place named Roscoe. So um, they were both interested. It was, and uh, school, we went to the local school. It was a two-teacher school. and. Uh, Poetry was an important part of the curriculum, and my father was the principal of the school, so yeah, he, he took great pleasure in, in you, you could sort of feel his own pleasure when we're learning the daffodils or G.K. Chesterton's The Donkey, or I think his favourite was Eva Gore Booth's uh, The Little Roads of Brethany. Mm -hmm. and, uh, so it was always there, and I was just very fortunate right through school. Some people had, you know, were, say that they had... Um, you know, very bad English teachers. I was just very fortunate. I had two really good English teachers in my secondary school. So um, I was lucky. I was lucky, you know. Uh, 
And the route to publication, Maya, your your first publications then were in Irish journals. Am I right? Yeah. Yeah, it was um again it was it was a very lucky time when I was at college. I mean I read a lot. My uh, I was a brother gave me presents of, of uh, collections of Antonio Machado and Neruda and an Australian friend uh, I, I encountered um Haiku because this Australian friend was passing through, she stayed in our flat and uh, she a friend had given her a beautiful collection of haiku uh, for her holidays in Ireland and I came across it and just absolutely fell in love with it and she was so kind of her. She left it with me while she was abroad Ireland and then sent me a companion volume and I was just not sideways by it and brought to that back to uh, the early Irish poetry. Um, there was a um, favourite book of Irish verse that came out, John Montagu's favourite book of Irish verse and that, that, that was sort of very important as well. Um, so I'd read quite a bit but um, had no, no aspiration at all to write. And then uh, in my early 20s, I, 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 Hibernia was out at the time. These were these broadsheets. It was, it, there was a lot of it around, little magazines, etc. And then um, I started to write. I did, my first job was quite demanding. And um, at once I said, now what do I like? You know, your college, you know, the, your community up at college has fall, fallen apart. I think it's a very hard time, actually, when young people leave college and with that incidental community falls apart. And um, I said, was there anything you enjoy? And I said, well, I love poetry and I love music. So I said, I'd have a crack at the books and uh, uh, the music wasn't, wasn't so successful there, but uh, I, uh, anyway, I stuck with the poetry. And um, there were, the first, first poem I had published was in New Irish Writing, David Marcus's wonderful page. I mean, he, it, that was just a wonderful conduit. And then there were wonderful magazines at that stage, ciphers, uh, et cetera, you know, the, the, the small magazines, which are very important. And, and, and people, and then when I moved to Galway, um, the Salmon Press, before they start to publish books, had a little magazine, and these little magazines create communities around them, which yes. is very, very valuable to emerging writers, the workshops yeah. and uh, the, the small communities. Um, I started actually, when I, I started to try to write, I went along to a workshop in the Raven Arts Centre, in, um, in uh, the Grapevine Arts Centre, sorry. Uh, in um, North Great Georgia Street, and uh, it was facilitated by Dermot Bulger. Mm -hmm. And uh, he, was, uh, he was even younger than the rest of us, but he, he was a wonderful facilitator, and uh, none of us knew anything. And so we were uh, free to experiment and to uh, enthuse about the poems that we loved and uh, to beat up each other's poems. And uh, we learned, <laughs> we learned, it was great fun. And and Moya, in terms of you know compiling the collected poems, were were you kind of surprised by your your young self? You know, particularly looking back to the early collections, do, do they surprise you in any way? I can't say they did. You know, mm -hmm. people always ask, you know, and is this new collection is it different? To, you know, how does it differ to the last? I have no perspective on that at all. I must confess. You know, it's like asking a snowman what the snow is like. <laughs> I mean, other people would be better qualified to to to, to see the shifts. Yeah. I mean, I, I can see their their preoccupations that run through the poems right from the start. Um, yeah. And uh, do they surprise me? No, they don't really. No, they don't. <laughs> Well, that's wonderful and, and, and wonderful, you know, for us as readers to, as I say, have that, that journey, you know, through the different collections. You also, you know, even as we heard this evening in your epigraphs, you're, you're very generous about citing influences. And I know, again, reading your work led me to Machado and Neruda and others. So could you tell us maybe a little more about that? You, you mentioned about your brother giving you that, that great gift and, and what... Machado and, and Neruda um, have, have meant for you, but I suppose in a way, I do, the second side to that question, with your own work now, thanks to the great work of Literature Ireland, you know, being translated, um, I'm, I'm just interested in that, that dual movement, I suppose, of, of the writers that influenced you and now seeing your, your own work in, in Portuguese and Spanish. Um. Yeah, when I started, I, I, I went to college with the intention of studying English and French and I got diverted and studied uh, history and politics instead. And um, so actually a lot of the poetry which I encountered first outside of my school curriculum, you know, which, which, mm -hmm. I, and which I was also very valuable, of course, 
was poetry in translation and it was usually when I think back on it, it was people like Pasternak Naroda who who had, who'd won Nobel Prizes, you know, and then they were pub translated and published, etc. Mm -hmm. And uh, I think there's something very special about encountering uh, poetry in translation because we, I mean, it's wonderful to have great teachers like yourself to introduce you to poems, but there's something about encountering a poem all by yourself, about mm -hmm. getting that sort of uh, aesthetic whack. Mm -hmm. and, um, I find that very exciting. Palms translations from the Chinese were important as well, uh, uh, and the haiku. Um, I think every every society probably because we're such such we're so full of contradictions as human beings. Every society will um, it will approve and foster one side of our personality and probably repress another. And then when you move out, when you when you move to another, when you read poetry in another another civilization or another civilization, it will celebrate an aspect which is possibly repressed in your own. And that's very exciting that free song mm. of, of, of encountering literature in in other um, in other languages. Um, I'm absolutely I was absolutely as regards and Rilke again. He was very very important uh, presence when I, I started to read him as well. Um, I was introduced through my good friend Eva Burke introduced me to the Eastern European poets. She lent me uh, Adam Chernowski's um, The Burning Forest many years ago. And that was an introduction to when it came out, introduction to people like Miwash and Herbert and Roosevelt's. And that again was very, very exciting. And uh, later um, was Adam Zagievsky as well. There was something, I don't know, just a very strong uh, link with, with um, Polish uh, poetry and translation. Um, and I am immensely grateful to Literature Ireland for the way in which they facilitated the, um, the translation of my own poems and immensely um, grateful to my translators, to, to Corky von der Breeder, who's become a great friend and Lucy Cullen from, uh, from, um, from Brazil and also Eric Giebel and uh, my neighbor, the, the poet, uh, great poet Eva Burke and uh, who translated into German as well. And um, it's, um, yeah, it's, it's been a great adventure. It's something I would never have dreamed of really. Yeah. Just very struck even in your reading this evening, Moya, and the whole experience of, of Zoom and, and the warmth of the comments coming through in chat is the importance of, of communities for you. And I suppose I'm particularly thinking of maybe younger members in the in the audience this evening, so to speak, and, and just how solitary our times can be. That it would be lovely just to hear you tell us a bit about. I suppose ab about communities and, and, and what they have meant for you as a form of solace. Um, I suppose I, I'm particularly thinking of, of, gosh, such moving moment of your reading to leave contact card. And I can't let the evening go any further without summoning Margaret McCurtain's <laughs> smile um, down on the two of us. But could you tell us a little about that? Because obviously that you know, that has brought experiences of loss, the loss of, you know, good friends like Tim Robinson yeah. uh, and others. But yeah. I suppose community seems to be all of what we're experiencing this evening, warmth coming through the chat. So. Well, well, writing, I mean, writing is such a solitary activity. It's very odd, you know, you, you, you start to do it, you start to write because you're probably not very extrovert. And uh, then, as I say, you know, people, tend to gravitate sort of timidly uh, yeah. towards work very often towards towards workshops initially I find they're not everybody needs them um, and I found it a fantastic sounding board before I started to publish and um, I, as I said I, I got in, I went along to the Great Fine Arts Centre which was wonderfully anarchic and great fun uh, when I lived in Dublin and then when I moved to Galway um, I was again really fortunate around the Salmon magazine there was another a uh, marvellous community of writers, which included um, Rita Ann Higgins, um, Fred Johnson, um, uh, Ava Burke, uh, Jessie Lendenny herself and her partner, Mike Allen, um, and uh, then later Mary O'Malley came back from Port Portugal. Really, there was a great bit of ferment and uh, then Coach started up and um, uh, so there was, first of all, there's local community, but then there was breath from outside and I think that's the secret really to have you know sort of stimulating uh, people coming in from outside and and yet the grounding up knowing that what's there is also very valuable and then very shortly after I read in Galway I got to know 
some very interesting people, um, uh, John Moriarty and Tim Robinson, Tim and Maraid Robinson. Um, John and Tim really only started publishing in their fifties, and they were both very exciting people. Uh, they, they they agreed about nothing. They were they, they were devoted to one another, great friends, and uh, Tim uh, does the the ultimate uh, pious materialist. And uh, John believed that, uh, that uh, material didn't exist at all, but the spirit and hibernation. And they were great sparring partners. And um, yeah, they, they're, they're, they're both gone, as, as is the wonderfully generous spirit of Margaret McCurtain. But there's, that's still there in the ether. It's still there in the ether, I think, you know. Um, but yeah, I think communities are they're immensely important because it's such a solitary, such a solitary uh, um, occupation. I always say that to to, uh, to students, you know, that um, although there's a certain amount of evidence to the contrary, uh, writing was never meant to be a, a competitive sport. <laughs> and, uh, we we need our we need our colleagues, and uh, it, it, I mean, who doesn't want to have really really good colleagues around in whatever job you're doing? Yeah, to be passed from hand to hand, as you say yourself. Um, and, you know, that's coming in again very strongly from the chat. People just commenting on how, you know, this evening is a food for heart and soul in the bleak times, Maya. Um, one that just looking to some of the, the questions that are coming in on, on the Q&A, uh, one of the comments says how your poems this evening have touched on climate and nature. How do you think the poet can adequately ta tackle the terrifying challenge of the climate? I don't know. I suppose it, we look after what we love. Mm. You know? If we don't love something, we're not going to mind it. Yeah. So, um, and I think maybe one, one thing we have learned during this uh, period of confinement, people have learned to love the locality to, and, and to become, have slowed down enough to, to see um, the, just the beautiful, the natural beauty around them and to appreciate it. I mean, so many people say that they've discovered new walks within their area, etc. Um, huge, huge efforts will have to be made in the next, uh, in the next decade, in the next few years even, to, to turn, to, to stop the tides rising, literally. Mm -hmm. um, and um, I suppose just um, what can writers do just to make people aware of, of what's around them and um, to, uh, I say, I, th I think we will mind what we love. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. N number of questions are coming in actually uh, about your own writing craft and uh, delighted to relay good wishes from Michael Longley, uh, who comments on your beautiful yeah. poems, Moya. And his question is, how do you arrive at your apparently effortless shapes? <laughs> well, um, how do I arrive? Well, usually there's something that interests me or intrigues me. So I uh, sit down and I, if I can at all, I go into the National Library. I love our National Library and I never bring my computer. And I sit down and I uh, just write, uh, just throw down all the ideas that come into my head. And it's usually said, that'll never make a poem. That's never going to make a poem. And then I uh, come back to it and just, I kind of beat it up really, you know, and, um, try and uh, just play around with the ideas really and I find it is extraordinary my mother used to say I think with my pen and I, I do as well once you begin to concentrate uh, you know ideas and images you know related images come in you know the, the sort of flow of thought or sequence mm -hmm. of thought and I just I play around with them until there's a moment when a poem a good poem you know, it didn't always happen when a poem sings and you know, then it's finished. But I spend a lot, I, I, I do an awful lot of drafting. I do not, and I, I apologize to the trees ever so often. I was just it. about to ask for, particularly with the, the, the National Library of Mind and future studies, do you draft by hand or on the computer? I, dra I do the first many drafts by hand. And then uh, it used to be, I just uh, put it onto the computer for the last little bit of tinkering. Mm -hmm. But I find now I'd probably do several quite a number of drafts on, on the computer as well. Probably moves, shifts onto the computer a bit earlier. Couldn't imagine, couldn't imagine starting a poem on the computer. But I, I mean, if I've an odd bit of prose to write, I can, I can do that all right on the computer, but not a poem. Mm -hmm. I don't know, I feel the images wouldn't come. <laughs> yeah. 
Um, Relaine, congratulations um, from Peter, sir, on your wonderful reading, Maya. And he asks, did you find the process of gathering your poems for the collected an enjoyable one? Um, I did actually, I, I couldn't believe there were so many. I, I, I sort of, uh, I was very surprised actually. And I was very surprised. Show it that. again. <laughs> <laughs> I was very surprised to discover I'd been that when somebody said to 30 years. Um, I did a, a, an interview recently and uh, Olivia O'Leary and she said, is, is, is a collected poem a tombstone, you know? <laughs> I said, I don't really think so. I hope not. And uh, they had suggested, well, she say, you should have said it was a milestone. And then uh, somebody today said, no, it's a halfway mark, you know? But um, it, I, I, it's, um, well, it's, to be perfectly honest, it's probably easier doing a collective than a selected. Because uh, you know you more or less just put them. To, you don't have to do quite so much winnowing or quite make quite so many decisions. So in one sense, it's a lazy option. And um, also, I suppose my my collections were all pretty short as well. So uh, that's uh, <laughs> that, that, was, that was an art. But the idea was actually to do a selected. I've been talking for a couple of years. Uh, uh -huh. Michael Smith and I have been discussing doing a selected. And then he suggested, said, "Why don't you?" I was supposed to bring it out a few years ago, but I had a lot of new poems, which I thought might be lost and selected. So we decided to do a collection first. And then um, he said, well, why don't you do uh, which are the collection which came out in um, 2019, Donegal, Tarantella. Mm -hmm. And then he said, well, why not do a collective rather than a selected? And I said, well, why not? So, uh, and there's a related question. Were you tempted to revise or change any of the earlier poems? I, I revised a little, mostly where there were errors, actually, where there were factual errors um, um, or things that, that irritated, you know, where I just hadn't, hadn't, uh, hadn't checked the facts. You were asking earlier about um, the process of writing for the poem. And um, I find that uh, at one stage I was trying to write a long poem, which I committed myself to doing, actually, a long poem about history, uh, about the history of, of two cities, Derry and... Um, Derry and uh, Waterford. And I researched, I was quite excited actually, this was back in 96 at a residency. I was quite excited and went off and read lots of, uh, read up on both cities and was most interested in it. Sat down to write and couldn't write it at all. Oh. And it's terrible because I was committed to it. But then I, I realized at that point that you don't actually research a poem in the same way that you might research a novel, but you do have to check your facts afterwards because otherwise it can be terribly embarrassing. So I, I think I might have let a few clangers through actually this time, <laughs> hope they're not too bad. Mostly, mostly I, I, I revised them just where there were errors, uh, factual errors, or where there were things that irritated me. I said, mm. there's one case where I said, that stands, it just, you know, it doesn't belong there. Oh, out, yeah. out, 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 but, but I didn't change it a lot, no. Not, not a lot, yeah. yeah. Ah, God, and um, that, I mean, that it's, it's very striking again, you know, coming back to, to Michael's point about, about the shape. In fact, one of the lovely features in a surprising way of the Zoom um, poetry launch, Maya, is to be able to see actually the poems as, as, as you read them and to see their, be their beautiful shape on the page. Um, and could we come back to a moment to the cover again? That was an opening question and you mentioned it briefly in your reading but could you tell us a little bit more about the cover image? Oh yes, uh, well, as I say, the, this little horse, um, I, it's, it's um, now in the Museum of Tübingen. I saw it again, actually, a second time when I was, uh, I went over, there was a, um, an exhibition of Ice Age art in the British Museum, so I went to see it again. Magnificent, magnificent exhibition. But um, the little horse is now uh, in the University of Tübingen, very near where it was made in, which I should have said, actually, in what's now southern Germany, just north of the Alpen Schwabia. And my, uh, my, my sister-in-law, uh, Sabina Springer, sent me a card, which she knew I really liked, so she sent me a postcard with it. And uh, we, the, uh, the University of Tübingen very kindly gave us permission to, to use it. And Andrew Latimer did a marvelous design. I was a bit puzzled first when I saw the little fellow standing on his head. I thought somebody so venerable shouldn't have been. Ah, there, so. yeah. But uh, anyway, it's... Um, it was found with a number of other tiny, tiny little figures as well, little mammoths in a cave. I think they were discovered first in the 30s, but they weren't properly researched until about the 1970s. Yeah. And, um, 
again, thanks to the University of Tübingen. And thank you very much to the artist from 32,000 years ago. Um, oh. for, for <laughs> 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 I rest my case on scale and it's wonderful to, to be moving back to that level of the past. I mean, yeah. we're, we're almost coming to the end of our sun-washed, unwasted hour of human contact. And I'm quoting obviously here from one of the new poems. I mean, it, it's a delight, Maya, to see, you know, the collection ending with new poems. And it was, again, to, as, as we move to the end, to ask you to tell us a little bit about your writing life um, at, in the moment uh, and the future, but also your hopes for the future it just seems a, a, an important question to close with? Oh, well, we hope that these, this, this, this strange year would have thrown us, I mean, it's thrown us back on our resources in a way that we would never have expected. Mm -hmm. So let us hope we'll have a more gentle and a more generous and fairer society coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And um, that we will, that we will, as I say, appreciate the things we've started to notice about us. Um, and say they, these, are, these are perilous times really. And we are the generation, really, who, who has to take control and, and make very difficult decisions. And uh, let, us, let us hope that that, is, that, 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 that this year will, will, will help in a, in a strange way. That um, there, there may be turbulent times ahead, there are turbulent times ahead, but uh, maybe the ship has turned around, you know, yes. the ship has turned around. In, in your new poems, light, I think, is, is something I was very struck by in, in the new poems that, yeah. that conclude the, the collection, is, is that sense of light? Well, I think, you know, it's, it's uh, the chink where the light comes in is always, you know, it's just so important. Um, it's, and, and focusing on that because it's so, it's so, so easy. To, to, to focus on the darkness and just to, to keep a focus on, on the uh, on possibility mm. because, and I think that is part of the job of poetry. I think hope is part of the job of poetry. It is many, it's, it's not all of it. I mean, it's, uh, you know, it's part of the job is, is to subvert uh, sort of calcified institutions, etc., and to speak up for justice. But I think, I think central to it, is um, I think Miwash said, you know, it, it has to be on the side of hope. Mm -hmm. And he was somebody who went through, saw a lot of darkness as well in Poland and elsewhere, you know. So, um, well, that's a beautiful note to close on, Moya. I mean, as, as we're all here in our kitchens and our living rooms, that sense of connection, um, you'll enjoy reading the chat later, you know, the congratulations and, and, and warmth, um, esteem and indeed love that's coming through. Moya, it's, it's just been a pleasure to be part of this. So, Gurmila Maharish, and I'll give, hand us over to Jasmine for the closing words. Oh, my good hand, Mark. Oh, my good Pleasure. Hand. Pleasure. Anyway. Thank you both so much. Um, this has been such a pleasure. Uh, congratulations, Moya, on your new book, um, on bringing out these collected poems. And thank you so much, Margaret, for the wonderful conversation. Um, it's been brilliant to hear you guys discuss this evening. So thank you so much. Um, and thanks to everyone for being here. As Margaret said, thanks for putting your message in, in the chat. I can see they're still coming in. Um, so I will leave the room open for a few minutes so you can get your last minute messages in there. Um, I can see they're still coming thick and fast. Um, so thanks again, everyone. Uh, I need to put your message in the chat. Here you go. This is how you buy the book. Um, but check your email tomorrow for that. Um, please, I implore you all to go and buy it. Um, if you can't find the discount code, send me an email and I will help you with that. Um, so the last thing that remains to be said is please join us again tomorrow. Um, it's our second New Poetries launch. Uh, we've got four new contributors to introduce you to. Um, so please check the website for the rest of our launches that are coming up and do join us again. Um, so congratulations again, Moya. And thank you, Margaret. And thank you, Moya, for a wonderful evening. Night, night. Thanks. You're right.